lately i've been noticing something weird going on in my bee yards it's like out of nowhere foragers just vanish and queens don't seem to be lasting as long as they once did and after the industry just saw the biggest colony collapse in history this winter i've had to start asking harder questions starting with why is this happening and what's changing in the environment that the bees can't adapt to because believe it or not bees can in fact adapt to their environment i used to be in the camp of thinking like oh only northern bees can survive in a northern climate so all these southern bees need to just stay away and stay down south well, believe it or not, that's actually not the case. Bees can adapt very quickly, especially because they have a very quick turnover rate of only 30 to 60 days, depending on the time of year, until the bees are pretty much all brand new in the colony. Well, now a brand new pesticide that was just approved in Argentina is now under EPA review in the United States for approval. This might give some clues as to what might be going on. And no, this isn't just another pesticide. This is a class of chemicals that can linger in our soil, the water, and maybe even in our food for centuries. Syngenta has developed a new pesticide called Cyclobutiflorum, and they say it is a breakthrough. It targets nematodes in soil-borne pathogens in crops like soybeans, lettuce, cotton, fruit trees, and even almonds, where it's being paired with fungicides in order to boost performance. They say it's good for no-till farming, and here's the thing. I live in an area in Michigan where most of our local farms actually don't till anymore. And I always wondered how they were getting away with this, but now I know it's chemicals like these that are doing all of the heavy lifting. But here's where things get complicated and here is why I'm making this video. Cyclobutiforum is what scientists call a fluorinated pesticide. And according to a 2024 study published in the Pest Management Science, it breaks down into, I always struggle to say this word, um, but trifluoroacetic acid, um, also known as TFA, a type of PFAS. So what exactly is a PFAS? When I say PFAS, I'm meaning PFAS. They're called forever chemicals for a reason. They don't break down. They bioaccumulate in the environment and in our bodies. They are nearly impossible to flush out of our bodies. And they've actually been linked to cancer, thyroid disorders, reproductive problems, and immune dysfunction. In fact, PFAS contaminated in soil and water has already forced some farms to shut down, especially in places like Maine where pasture-raised dairy operations were completely wiped out by legacy contamination. The National Association of State Departments of Agriculture is calling PFAS a major hazard and actually asking for emergency support. So this isn't just a theory, this is actually real and happening. But you know, this is where it gets a little wild because this isn't something that just happened overnight. Syngenta has actually been working on this one chemical, Cyclobutiflorum or Timerium for over a decade. It's the fifth in their lineup of what they call SDHI fungicides and nematicides. These are high tech chemicals designed to stop disease and parasitic worms at the root level, literally. And recently, Asia's top agricultural authority announced that Syngenta had officially filed to get registered there too, making it to the first time this pesticide enters the Asian market. Syngenta is actually projecting that it could hit $500 million in sales globally, making it a blockbuster chemical. So what does it actually do? Cyclobutiflorum works by targeting something deep in the pest biology, it's mitochondria. If you remember back in science class, back when you were in school, mitochondria is completely responsible for the production of energy in your cell. 
So it basically shuts down their energy production and that is how it kills off things like root knot nematodes in crops like cucumbers, tomatoes, sugar beets, and even corn now too. And it's not just a surface spray. This stuff is designed to go into the soil or coat the seeds and it lasts a very long time, giving what Syngenta calls a long acting protection. So to get this product out there, Syngenta has multiple patents across the entire world in the United States, in Canada, Australia, Europe, Japan, you name it, that lasts until 2033. So that is a full decade of exclusive rights and it's already being paired with fungicides on almonds. Yes, you guys heard this right. It is being used on almonds in fungicides based on a recent patent filing. That means it's getting layered into real world use right now, even before full regulatory approval in some countries. Now, I'm not saying that innovation and pest control is a bad thing. Farmers really do need better tools in their pocket, but the big question is at what cost? If this chemistry is as persistent as it seems, if it breaks down into PFAS, if it starts showing up in our water, soil, and our food, like other fluorinated chemicals already have, are we truly ready for that legacy? But here's where it hits home for me and maybe for you too. So this year, commercial beekeepers lost 62% of their colonies, one of the worst die-offs we have ever seen in history. Queens are failing earlier and more often. This is actually a topic that's been brought up quite a few times in some meetings and in some commercial groups. It just seems that our queens aren't really lasting as long as they used to anymore. They really are only lasting a year, if that. And some may say that this is due to poor breeding, but it's important to remember that colony health does in fact affect the longevity of your queen. Now, I'm not saying that cyclobutiflorum is the cause, but we do know that PFAS do impact the thyroid and liver in all animals. And no, I do know that insects do not possess a liver like we know in humans to be like this distinct organ, but they do have a form of detoxification and metabolic functions associated with a liver that vertebrates have handled by a widely distributed tissue called the fat body. Y'all have heard me talk about this many times. The fat body of a bee is literally their life force. And we also know from multiple studies that pesticide exposure, especially persistent ones, messes with bee reproduction, navigation, and longevity. And believe it or not, it has also been said that PFAS exposure might also play a hidden role in queen failures, weakened immune response, developmental issues in larvae, and reduced foraging and navigation ability. But to be honest, we don't have all of the data yet, but if PFAS affects humans and animals at the cellular level, it's not really a stretch to imagine that they're also affecting insects too, especially when sprayed directly on flowering crops or coated on seeds. And if these new pesticides are being applied to seed coatings, sprayed on trees and left to sit in the soil for three years or more, really we're setting up our pollinators and ourselves for a slow and invisible kind of stress. In the paper that I was reading, environmental scientists were actually saying that this is a huge step backwards. They said that it's pretty much like we're returning to the DDT era where dangerous long lasting chemicals were sprayed like candy. And some were even saying that communities already dealing with PFAS and drinking water could now have it sprayed directly on crops and in soil. So now they're getting it in their food too. But here's the part that really got me and maybe it'll get you thinking too. So cyclobutiflorum does stay in the soil for three years, but after that, it doesn't just disappear, it actually breaks down into something far worse. It turns into that compound TFA that I was talking about. And that is where the real problem starts. 
TFA has a half-life of 200 years. That means that it's going to be hanging around for a long time after we're gone. And honestly, long after our grandkids' grandkids are born. It's one of those forever chemicals that is not going anywhere. Now, if you pop into Google and just do a little search for yourself, type in cyclobutaforum and bees, what you're probably going to see in the top results is something like, hey, don't worry, it's safe for pollinators. But if you dig just one layer deeper, the story starts to change a little bit. So TFA, this is the breakdown product that cyclobutaforum breaks down into. If you look that up, it is toxic to bees. Yes, toxic. It's been shown to mess with bee reproduction and development, which means it could actually affect queen viability, drone sperm health, and larval survival. That directly impacts colony strength and long-term survival of our hives. But TFA doesn't just stay in the soil, it is highly mobile. It moves through water, so it could end up in flower nectar, pollen, dew on leaves, and even in puddles, all places bees naturally drink from. So while Cyclobutaforum could check the box as being bee safe on a regulatory form, its breakdown product, the thing that it turns into, could be quietly undermining colonies over the long haul. And with the kind of queen failures and the massive losses that we have been seeing, 62% in commercial operations this winter alone, we need to be asking the tough questions about every chemical that we introduce into the system. Because this stuff is not just sticking around, it's moving, it's multiplying, and it might actually be messing with the very insects that we depend on in order to pollinate the crops we're trying to actually protect, you know? But I want to be very, very clear here. I am not anti-farmer at all. I actually fully support farmers. In fact, I love seeing my neighbors embracing no-till farming because, you know, it saves topsoil. It locks in the carbon instead of pushing it all out into the atmosphere and it's better for water quality. But the trade-off, these systems often rely on a chemically intense solution to deal with pests underground. When those chemicals include PFAS, we need to be very, very careful. The big question that we should all be asking is, are we solving one environmental crisis by quietly creating another? Oh, so the question is, what do we do with all of this information? So here's what I think. First things first, stay informed. Pesticide labels rarely tell the full story, but the science is slowly kind of starting to catch up. And second, let's push for full transparency, especially when it comes to PFAS in agriculture. And thirdly, support innovation that gives farmers more tools that maybe they wouldn't have to rely on forever chemicals like this. And lastly, as beekeepers, let's document everything that we are seeing. Queen failures, forager crashes, sudden die-offs, they all paint a picture and honestly, we really need that picture to be crystal clear to get any sort of changes done. So if this pesticide does get EPA approval and the signs are really kind of pointing to yes, in fact, from what I was seeing, it kind of looks like we've already been using it. Um, this could be one of those moments that we look back on on years from now and wonder why didn't we speak up? But it's not about blaming. It's not, we're not blaming the farmers whatsoever. This is all about asking better questions, pushing for better solutions, and working together as farmers, beekeepers, and as scientists. That's the only way we're ever going to get anything accomplished. And this is the only way that we're going to be able to build a future that actually lasts longer than the chemicals that we use on it. So thanks for watching. As always, stay curious, stay grounded, and let's keep building the kind of agriculture system that we would actually want to inherit. So with that, see you in the next one. Don't quit, be fit.